Hello, and welcome to the advantages of switching to biodiesel. My name is Carl Lissick, the Lake Michigan Consortium, and thank you for joining us on our winter webinar series. The Lake Michigan Consortium consists of Wisconsin Clean Cities, Chicago Area Clean Cities, and South Shore Clean Cities. Our goal is to provide our three state stakeholders with opportunities, training, and grant opportunities to enhance fleet performances and reduce emissions while working to leverage our strengths to create opportunities. Please watch our websites for upcoming webinars. We have an exciting webinar today with three nationally known biodiesel leaders. First of all, we'll have Mr. Troy Schoen, who is the senior manager of the Renewable Energy Group, start things off, followed by Ms. Jennifer Weaver, who is the OEM Market Development Manager for the National Biodiesel Board. And last but not least, Mr. Michael Dimitrov, Manager of the Air Initiatives for the Chicago Park District. All attendees are in listen-only mode, and this webinar will be recorded. And if you have any questions during today's presentation, please raise your hand and we'll take questions at the end of all the speakers' presentations. As you may know, biodiesel has grown into a 2 billion gallon per year industry with 125 plants across the country, supporting more than 64,000 jobs and providing $11 billion in economic impact. Let's get things started with Mr. Troy Schoen of REG. Troy, take it away. Terrific, thank you, Carl. Uh, one thing I did wanna note is that we will have these slides available for you uh, following the uh, webinar. So I have quite a few slides on here and I'm not gonna make it through all of them, otherwise I wouldn't give enough time for, for Jennifer and others uh, to present. So I, uh, I'm not gonna hit on every single slide that's in the presentation, but you will get a copy of this to look at following the webinar so you'll have a chance to go back to some of those slides. And if you have any questions about anything you see on there, please reach out to me, you'll have my contact information and you can give me a call or, or drop me an email. I want to start uh, here today with a brief overview of Renewable Energy Group. Uh, we are a publicly traded company, so I have to put this safe harbor statement out there whenever I get started on the presentation. Nothing you're going to hear today is, is proprietary. It's all, all public information. Renewable Energy Group has a mission to enable a cleaner world through lower carbon intensity products and services. And we do that through uh, the production of biomass-based diesel, uh, whether that be biodiesel or renewable uh, hydrocarbon diesel. And we have 13 biomass-based diesel plants across the country producing over 500 million gallons of, of biodiesel annually. Uh, when you look at the biodiesel industry domestically, it's somewhere you know, around 2.8, 2.9 billion gallons and, and REG being 500 million gallons of that total production, uh, we're a pretty significant player in the overall uh, production of, of biomass-based diesel. A uh, couple of plants that I want to point out on this slide out of, out of all of them, since we are uh, here at the Great, Great Lakes Consortium, is our plant in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And this is a 20 million gallon a year nameplate capacity uh, facility. It's actually in DeForest, Wisconsin, which is right outside of Madison. And uh, that started production of, of biodiesel back in 2007. I believe it was in April of 2007 that that plant uh, first got, got commissioned. Um, REG, I became part of REG in, in 2016, and uh, really excited to have that be a part of our overall um, uh, system here at REG, and we have lots of opportunities uh, uh, to sell, you know, biodiesel, uh, B99, B100 biodiesel uh, from that location. And so for, for fleets and folks in, in the Wisconsin area, uh, you know, certainly that, that facility allows uh, very economical biodiesel to be used in the state of Wisconsin. Now, not to ignore uh, my friends in Illinois and, and uh, Indiana as well, we have uh, two facilities in, in Illinois. One is in Danville, Illinois, which is just across the border from Indiana. Um, and then we also have a facility in, in Seneca, Illinois as well. So we have some really good footprint for biodiesel facilities in that Great Lakes region and can, can help get biodiesel very economically to any fleet or anybody interested in, in using it in those locations. This is just a map of our overall footprint. Uh, the plants we talked about, those are the green boxes on this, this map. The blue boxes, what those are, those are our terminal locations. So these are locations where we have either uh, diesel fuel, uh, biodiesel, blends of biodiesel and diesel fuel, or uh, heating oil, or a uh, blend of biodiesel and heating oil called bioheat, or renewable diesel as well. So these blue locations, if you were to look at this map, uh, five years ago, you would have seen just a handful of, of, 
terminal locations or assets that REG had. Uh, you look at this map today, and this is a pretty significant footprint for the movement of, of biodiesel and renewable diesel. And REG is going to continue to grow. And if you're going to look at this map five years from now, you're going to see even uh, uh, maybe double the amount of, of blue boxes that you see on here. Uh, we definitely have an initiative to try to, to reach out our, our terminal footprint to get more locations for biodiesel to be distributed around the country because we want everywhere, regardless of where you're at, to be able to have access to, to biodiesel and, and, and use it in, in, um, in your fleet. And so one way we felt we can do that is, is to help grow this terminal footprint that we have, and, and you can see that represented here on this map. We do have, have several products that we offer. Our biodiesel and renewable diesel we offer under a brand name called REG9000. Uh, that's a nod to the BQ9000 accreditation program that we're going to talk about here in a couple of slides. Um, we also uh, do sell straight diesel fuel, and some people kind of scratch their heads and say you're the largest biodiesel producer and, and your goal is to, to help improve the, the environment, so why do you sell straight diesel fuel? Well, we recognize that, that um, you know, in order to, to use biodiesel, you've got to have something to, to blend it into, and so um, by having diesel available at terminal locations, we're able to sell biodiesel blends from B2 to, to B20 or even higher, uh, selling uh, B50 today to, to somebody in the Midwest. So. Um, certainly, um, uh, having a diesel position at those locations helps to, to get blended fuel out there. And then, like I said, we also offer straight heating oil and then the blend of biodiesel and heating oil called BioHeat. And that primarily uh, focus of that is up in the Northeast uh, markets. So that's REG, but what about biodiesel in general? And from a very high level, I'm, I'm probably the least technical person um, not only on this phone call, but um, uh, certainly in, in the building here at REG. But um, from a very high level, uh, what biodiesel is, it takes triglycerides from various fats and oils. It reacts to those triglycerides with methanol, and during this process called transesterification, you get two products. You get glycerin and you get methyl esters, and methyl esters is just another name for, for biodiesel. That's the, the product that you're, that you're wanting to produce, and, and so that's a, a very high level of how this process works. seems pretty simple, and, and it is. So anybody can produce uh, biodiesel with the right recipe. And in the early days of biodiesel production, you certainly had anybody producing it. You had people producing it in their, in their garages and their bathtubs at, at home, putting it in their VW and, and you know, running around on it. Um, so the industry has changed a lot from those days. And things like BQ accreditation program and ASTM standards and all of these things have been put in place to help make sure that, that only high-quality biodiesel is out there in the marketplace today. And that's where our industry has, has evolved to today. So while the process at a very high level is pretty simple, those, uh, those things that have been put in place uh, create an industry which is very technical and, and highly skilled, and REG is one of those highly skilled uh, producers. The benefits of biodiesel I could really categorize into, into three areas. It enhances the, the performance of engines. It improves the environment, and it reduces overall fuel costs. And so if I'm meeting with a fleet for the very first time, and, and I say, hey, if I could offer you a product that does those three things, would you be interested? 100% of the time, they say yes. So why then, when you look at the industry, and biodiesel itself is less than 5% of the total distillate pool in our country, why is biodiesel not more readily adopted because it offers those three advantages, really the three key advantages to any fuel buyer or fuel purchaser in our country. If you, you could offer those three things, then, then they'd say, yeah, you, it's a product that I'm interested in buying. So why is biodiesel less than 5% of the total distillate pool? Um, the answer is I don't know. I, you know, I wish it were, it were greater, and, and it should be greater. And, and, and I think um, we all have opinions on, on reasons that, that it's being held back. But one of the ways we can get around that is things like, like what we're doing here today and, and webinars where we can bring the, the, the Clean Cities um, consortiums together and, and bring folks like all of you on the line together to, to talk about the benefits of biodiesel and break through some of these, these myths or things that are out there about biodiesel so that it can be more, more readily adopted into the total, total distillate pool. So that's, you know, that's what we're doing here today and what we hope to accomplish. One of the other ways we can do that, I believe, is with true facts and, and information. And, and it's, it's great to tell somebody that, that biodiesel improves the environment, but if you don't have some charts and things to actually show people that, um, sometimes um, it, it might not be um, truly understood. And so this is one of those charts that I like to show. 
And, and what you're looking at here is the 0% on this line is straight diesel fuel. And everything above the line is the percent reduction that biodiesel brings in emissions reductions in these three categories. So if you look at total hydrocarbons, for example, a 100% biodiesel is going to reduce total hydrocarbons versus straight number two ULSD by 70%. That's pretty significant. So if you blend out at a B20 level, at a 20% biodiesel level, you get a 10% reduction in total hydrocarbons. Then if you move over to particulate matter, at a B20 blend, you have almost a 20% reduction in particulate matter. And particulate matter is that black soot and smoke that comes out of the back of a tailpipe of a diesel uh, a truck or a diesel bus. And particulate matter can be reduced by almost 20% from using just a B20 blend of biodiesel. That's pretty significant. And when you look at carbon monoxide at a B20 blend, biodiesel reduces that by almost 5%. So you get some very significant emissions benefits from the use of, of biodiesel just at a 20% uh, uh, blend level. In fact, if you look at total greenhouse gas emissions, and this is just REG data, if you look at, at total greenhouse gas emissions, we have reduced since 2010 over 3 million metric tons of carbon monoxide since 2010. Um, that, that's pretty cool, I'm, and I'm pretty proud of that, and that's why I, I share that. We've actually displaced over 1 billion gallons of diesel fuel since 2010. I know one of the goals of the Clean Cities Coalition is to, to displace uh, petroleum diesel, and, and, uh, and, and just think that REG has, has done that by over 1 billion gallons since, since 2010. So, it's pretty cool. We've done some pretty cool things in a very uh, short period of time, and, and we're just one company. So when you look at the total industry, that's a pretty significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions um, over time. One of the things in those early days that I talked about when you had all those folks who were blending biodiesel in their garage and their bathtub, and, and one of the things that the industry realized, and, and MVP and Jennifer is going to talk here in a minute, but, but one of the things the industry realized is that we have to put some specifications in place to make sure that what's being produced is of, of high quality. So an ASTM specification was established. The D6751 is the specification for biodiesel, and it, it requires 20 tests be done on, on biodiesel. It includes both quality and performance indicators. Um, one thing to note that the specification did not specify specific feedstocks, but, but it specified the finished uh, fuel. And, um, and that's an important, important component of this. The other compo important component was the establishment of, of the need for a certificate of analysis. And, and if you decide to, to buy biodiesel and to use that, um, make sure that with every load, your, per, your provider of the biodiesel can provide a certificate of analysis, because that's really important and all of them should be able to, to do that. When you look at REG 9000 product specification, so just, just our specification, you can see how we compare against the ASTM standard. And we meet or exceed the ASTM standard in, in every category that they have on here. But we actually went even above and beyond the ASTM standard and said, you know what, there's some other things that are important for us to be testing. So we look at things like monoglycerides and diglycerides and the triglyceride content and moisture and, and density. And we believe that those are important attributes as well. So we actually go above and beyond the ASTM uh, specification in place to do some additional tests on our product to make sure that our REG 9000 biodiesel is the highest quality biodiesel available um, out in the marketplace. The other important uh, thing that our industry did was put in a BQ 9000 accreditation program. And, and this is a program for producers and, and marketers. And there's a set of, of very rigorous quality programs that, that we have to make sure that we're in place and, and uh, can be accredited for those. And, and make sure that we aren't having any off-spec biodiesel leave the plant. And, um, and so we, all of our plants are BQ9000 accredited, and it's one of the things that, that is very important to us. And, and most of the plants nowadays in the industry, the, the large refineries of, of biodiesel, are, are BQ9000 accredited uh, so that we can ensure that the, that the industry is of, of high quality. REG's uh, product lineup, we offer three products of, of biodiesel, and we distinguish those based on their cloud point. And so we have an REG 9001, which has a cloud point between negative 2 to plus 2 degrees Celsius. Our REG 9005 has a range of 3 to 7 degrees Celsius, and REG 9010 will range from 8 to 12 degrees Celsius. And 
what that cloud point does is just gives you a range of of, um, of where this product will will um, work in what environments. And so if you're in the in a northern climate and and uh, you're you're sitting here in, in January or February and you're interested in, in using biodiesel, you may want to use an REG9001 biodiesel that has a little lower cloud point specification to it. If you're down in in Houston, Texas, or or someplace in the south. Um, you, you may want to use an REG9010, which has a little bit higher cloud point because you don't care as much about the, the cloud point because your temperature is going to stay uh, well above the 46 degrees Fahrenheit that this product will, will work in. And, and so you're going to want to recognize a bit of a savings from using an REG9010 product versus using an REG9001 in the wintertime. So, so choosing which product um, to use, obviously REG uh, uh, can help you decide what product is right for you according to where you're at in the country, but certainly you can look at this as a parameter for what product you want uh, for your finished specification. The important thing here is that you want to decide what's right for you. So you want to decide what's right for your situation, um, for your part of the country, and what you're comfortable with, and you want to say, and you want to let the producer know that that's my specification for biodiesel that I want to use. And then it's up to the producer to hit that. So REG is feedstock agnostic, which means that, that we don't use just uh, virgin vegetable oils in the production of our biodiesel. We actually will use um, animal fats, we'll use, use cooking oil, we'll um, certainly use some uh, uh, vegetable oils like soybean and canola oils. And, and in edible corn oils, and we'll use some of these products to hit the finished specification that our customers demand. So we look at that finished specification and we look at all these different triglyceride types that come into our system, and we've perfected the recipe to take all these different feedstocks and still hit that finished specification for what the customer demands. So that's why it's important to keep in mind that, that don't just call in and, and say, hey, I'm interested in, in soy biodiesel or I'm interested in canola biodiesel or whatever it is. Instead, call in and say, hey, I'm interested in a biodiesel that will hit this parameter or these specifications and let the producer um, decide how best to produce that. The advantage that gives to the end user is a couple things. Number one is that you aren't tied into just one specific market for, for biodiesel. If you specify only soy biodiesel and the soybean oil industry goes up, the, the cost of soybean oil increases, the cost of your biodiesel is going to increase as well. If you don't specify the feedstock that goes in, but just the finished uh, parameter for that product, and soybean oil goes up, we'll switch to an edible corn oil or use cooking oil to a different product to help alleviate that cost increase to you, the end user of, of your biodiesel. So that's why it's important to, to pay more attention to the finished specification than it is the, the feedstock going in uh, to, to that biodiesel. As you can see, there's retailers all across the country selling uh, biodiesel. You look at this map five years ago, you'd see a lot fewer blue dots. You look at this map 10 years ago, you'd see a handful of dots on here. The industry has really embraced, the fuel industry in general has really embraced biodiesel, and you've seen the number of retailers offering blends of B10 to B20 um, increase significantly all across the country, all times of the year. You look at Minnesota, and they have a usage requirement in place. Uh, for, for B20 in the summer months, and, and, and really anywhere in the country you're seeing folks use biodiesel, and they're doing that for those three reasons that I mentioned earlier, the enhanced performance, the improved environment, and the reduction in fuel costs. If you look at some of the largest travel centers and truck stops who have locations all across the country, they're using B20 about year-round because of the financial advantage that they get from doing that. How does that financial advantage uh, recognize? So, so how do you see it as, as an end user or, or as somebody interested in, in biodiesel? What, what does that financial advantage look like? Well, there's a couple of things. And really, I like to point to, to three areas that have helped make biodiesel cost competitive um, anywhere in the country. But certainly, there's certain pockets where financially it makes a little bit more sense. But those three areas are uh, the federal uh, in, incentive, um, through the renewable fuel standard that was established and established renewable identification numbers or RINs. And those RINs have a true economic value to them out in the marketplace, and that helps offset the cost of producing biodiesel. The second thing is the tax credit. And um, the tax credit was put into place retroactively for 2017, but we don't have it in place looking ahead here in 2018 as we sit here today. 
that tax credit is very important to help us uh, produce biodiesel in a cost competitive way versus petroleum diesel. And you look at the, the petroleum diesel, you look at the crude, crude oil industry, I mean, all of these industries are incentivized. Um, most industries that have gotten their start in our U.S. Have, have had some sort of incentive there in place to do that. And, and just like those industries, the biodiesel industry needs that tax credit as well to help biodiesel be economically viable everywhere in the country so that a fleet anywhere in the country can recognize those benefits of, of using biodiesel. So that's the second economic um, driver for biodiesel. And the third is in state incentives. And that's the map that you see here up, up on your screen now is that certain states have incentives in place to further enhance the, the incentive of using biodiesel. So uh, you look at Iowa that has a significant tax incentive in place. You look at Illinois um, who has a 6.25% tax um, uh, differential in place. Um, you look at the state of Texas for um, you know, B100, there's a 20, per, uh, a 20 cent per gallon uh, tax uh, savings that you get. So if you just blend at a, a B20 level, you're, you're, um, you know, you're looking at, at four or five cents advantage there. Um, you look at California with their low carbon fuel standard in Oregon and, and soon to be Washington. Um, there's significant incentives all across the country in these certain pockets of, of the country to incentivize the use of biodiesel. And those just help offset the cost um, and help it reduce the cost of biodiesel even further against petroleum diesel. Here's a, an example uh, for you, and, and um, if we were all live in a room, I'd do this up on a board so, so you can kind of kind of walk your way through this. And some of these numbers are, are a bit outdated. I know if you look at the diesel price today, you're closer to $2 a gallon. But for illustrative purposes, uh, at this particular time, if you looked at the cost of number two ULSD, and it was $1.65 a gallon. If you were to go to uh, REG plant, so let's say um, REG Madison in, in Madison, Wisconsin, and pick up a B99 uh, biodiesel from our plant, at the same time, you would have paid $2.95. So are you, fleet manager, fuel purchaser, going to buy biodiesel for $2.95 if you can buy diesel fuel for $1.65? Heck no. You aren't going to do it. You're going to lose your job if you do that, right? I don't care how much you care about the environment or how much you care about enhancing the performance of your engine. You aren't going to do it for that price. You're going to spend a dollar thirty more a gallon to buy biodiesel. You'd lose your job if you did that. So, so we need these other incentives that are in place to help offset some of that cost of production of, of biodiesel and the cost of the feedstock. And one of the things that does that, as I mentioned, was the renewable fuel standard, which established the renewable identification numbers. So for easy math here, I put REN value at a dollar. Uh, today, it's somewhere in the low 80 cents range. Uh, but for this illustrative purpose, I put it at a dollar. And biodiesel qualifies for 1.5 D4 REN. So you take that dollar worth of value, you multiply that by 1.5, and you have a dollar 50 worth of value that the REN creates. And you just simply subtract that off the price to actually produce the, the biodiesel, the $2.95. And so if you actually go into REG Madison to pick up biodiesel, in this illustrative example, you'd be paying $1.45 a gallon versus going to the rack and picking up diesel fuel for $1.65. So you would recognize a $0.20 cent per gallon savings by using biodiesel. And this illustrative example, while the numbers may be a little bit different today, diesel prices would be closer to $2, REG plant price would be, uh, you know, closer to the low $3 uh, range. That difference or that disparity between the price of diesel fuel and the price of biodiesel uh, still remains, and that, that will continue to, to remain as long as the, the RFS stays in place. Um, so, so you recognize savings using biodiesel. Now, that savings can be offset if you're a significant distance away from a biodiesel plant because freight can eat that cost up a bit. But if you're within the range of, of the, the Great Lakes region, and I talked about our three plants that we have within that region, um, you're within range of, of being able to, to have a, a biodiesel at, at a cheaper price than, than diesel fuel. And, and, um, and so there's no, no reason to pay more for biodiesel, certainly in, in that location and many locations around the country. And then the other component to throw on top of this is those state incentives that I talked about. And so if you're getting a 6.25% tax savings like you are in the state of Illinois on top of these economics, that just makes even more sense to use biodiesel and, and start including that in, in, um, in your fuel lineup. So one question I get asked before I, I jump into to my concluding slides here and, and turn it over 
uh, to, to Jennifer is that, well, that's great that I can save all this money using biodiesel, but what am I going to lose out on fuel efficiency? And, and I'd argue that that argument, um, you know, you hear that more on the ethanol side than you do the really the biodiesel side. There hasn't been a lot of significant work that's been done, but there have been four published studies that have shown that there's no st statistical significant difference in fuel efficiency between a B0 and, and a B20. And I can get you more information on those four studies if you're curious in digging in the, into those a little bit more. But the reality is that is that biodiesel up to a B20 blend, you aren't going to lose out on the fuel efficiency. You're going to reduce the number of regens that you have in, in your engine. You're going to get benefits that, such as the lubricity that, the, and the higher cetane, which actually help with, with efficiency. And so you aren't going to have a reduction in fuel efficiency when you use biodiesel. So, so there's really no uh, disadvantage uh, economically. In fact, there's a significant advantage economically to, to using biodiesel in your, um, in your fuel lineup. So let me conclude with, with maybe um, you're online right now and, and you're managing a fleet or a municipality and, and, and you're a fuel buyer and you say, well, this sounds great, Troy. I'm, I'm interested in, in potentially, you know, using biodiesel and putting it into, into my fleet. How do I go about doing that? So let me give you five steps to, to leave with here on how you can successfully integrate biodiesel into, you, into your vehicle lineup. Uh, first is you want to consider your comfort level with blending. So you have to make a decision whether you want to do the biodiesel blending yourself or whether you just want to go to a distributor or go to the rack and, and, and buy it. Certainly your greatest economic advantage or the lowest fuel cost uh, overall is for you to do the blending yourself. For you to go and work with a company like REG and buy uh, B99 biodiesel direct from one of our plants and have it delivered to a tank where you have the biodiesel and then you also have the diesel fuel tank and you do the blending yourself. That's where you're gonna recognize that 20 cent worth of savings. That's where you're gonna recognize the, the greatest savings per gallon. However, there is a bit of an upfront cost if you don't already have a tank available to use, use biodiesel. So the second option is to uh, go to a distributor and ask your distributor if they carry uh, biodiesel. In all instances, those distributors, um, you know, hopefully they, they um, uh, those distributors carry biodiesel, and if they don't, you need to find a, a distributor who does. Step two of integrating biodiesel into your fuel lineup is to confirm the quality of your biodiesel supply. So if you have decided that, that yes, I want to start using biodiesel, and either you want to buy B99 or you're buying a, a blended fuel from a distributor from the rack, still make sure that the quality of that biodiesel is, is sound. So make sure that it meets the ASTM D6751 standards. Make sure it's coming from a BQ9000 accredited producer. Make sure that that producer can provide a certificate of analysis with each load. If they can't, then you shouldn't buy from them because they should be able to do that. And work with a producer that can provide additional technical support. You have a team of, of lab people who can, can take your fuel samples and do the testing that you want to do with it. Step three is to determine the blend level that you want to use. Um, I recommend, if you're hesitant about using biodiesel for whatever reason, start with a B2 or 2% blend level and move up from there. I'm pretty confident that, that you'll move up pretty quickly because you'll like that, the, the advantages that biodiesel gives you. Um, but decide at what level, what blend level you, you want to use. Um, certainly, if you're in January and you see a cold front coming through, um, you probably don't want to start out right at a B20. You probably want to start at something a little bit lower and work your way up from there. Step four is to educate your employees. So talk to your employees about the benefits of biodiesel and why you're wanting to use more biodiesel and, and putting it as part of your, your fuel lineup. Make sure that they're educated on the advantages of biodiesel because they're pretty significant and, and they'll want to feel good about, the, about uh, using biodiesel. And then step five, the final one, is just to reap the benefits of it. Uh, reduce, you know, reap those benefits of reduced emissions, of the increased engine performance, of the um, better fuel cost to you and, and just, just recognize that, that biodiesel has some pretty significant benefits to you and at the end of the day can do those three things, enhance performance, improve the environment, and reduce fuel costs. Um, so I think I'll, I'll conclude there and this presentation has some, some case studies here at the end I'll let you spend some time with on your own and, and it shows some examples of fleets that have integrated uh, biodiesel successfully into their fuel program and have reaped the rewards of, of doing that. And, and so I'll let you spend some time with those. But um, you know, at this time, I'll, uh, I'll be done and turn it over to Jennifer. I think we're taking questions um, here at the end if you have any. 
That, that's correct, Troy. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, Ms. Jennifer Weaver, who is the OEM Market Development Manager for the National Biodiesel Board, is with us now. Jennifer? Thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to join you today. Uh, as they mentioned earlier, I am uh, serving as the OEM Market Development Manager for the National Biodiesel Board. In that role, I'm essentially kind of a liaison between the auto and equipment manufacturers and the biodiesel industry and working with them to uh, foster their continued uh, support and, and growth and support of the use of biodiesel blends in their current and future diesel vehicle models. So uh, I'd like to start off my comments today with, with a question that seems to be kind of top of mind in the media and in the marketplace today, um, and that is, how will diesel most likely be changed in the future? You know, there, there are always a slew of new technologies being discussed in the marketplace and in the media, like I said. Um, electrification is all the buzz nowadays. So what, what does the road ahead look like? And really, in order to answer that question, we really need to consider both the fuels market as well as the vehicle market. They really work hand in hand and are inseparable. Um, and as the automakers are seeking to comply with ever increasing um, and increasingly stringent requirements for their vehicle performance in terms of fuel efficiency and cleanliness, um, those are impacting, those requirements are impacting their future product planning efforts, as well as the fuel choices that go into those vehicles. So we're going to spend a little time uh, talking about that today. The good news is, um, despite all of uh, you know the, the talk about electrification, especially when we look at the commercial vehicle market where most you know fleets are operating, um, those vehicles are going to continue to be depending upon uh, you know your traditional combustion engines, both diesel and gasoline powertrain um, engines, for quite a while to come. So recently, uh, the Fuels Institute last year instituted a, a study or commissioned a study rather through Navigant Research, looking closely at um, future projections for the medium and heavy duty vehicle fleet through 2025 was their for forecast period they were looking at. And you can kind of see here by these charts, uh, the big yellow bar here represents um, the, the share of the market that diesel powertrains are going to continue to dominate through 2025, um, again, the forecast period. This tiny little black strip that you see up here are the other powertrains, um, and gasoline still has a, a large share as well. So this first block is uh, the U.S. market. The bottom block there is the Canadian market share, uh, where diesel powertrains are even more omnipresent. Now let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm going to here just to make sure you can all all hear me correctly. Um, if we look a little bit in more detail here, we can see that even through uh, the forecast for 2025, diesel is, is uh, dominating about 62% of powertrains in the commercial vehicle. Um, you know, they, they lose a little bit of share perhaps over um, the time, but it's, it's being actually brought up then by hybrid electric diesel and plug-in hybrid electric diesel. So again, we're going to continue to see diesel powertrains in the marketplace for, for quite some time. Now the good news for biodiesel is what if there is a, a way to operate all of those diesel vehicles in a cleaner and more sustainable way without sacrificing the performance that fleets demand, as you can see by this rather extreme picture here. We ask a lot of our diesel vehicles. They need to tow. They need to have great fuel economy. Um, biodiesel can solve that problem for them. Um, biodiesel blends up to B20, and in some cases, higher blends um, can be used in existing or legacy equipment, as well as the new technology diesel engines without modification. And B20 is supported by over 90% of the OEMs in the, in the marketplace. When we uh, take a look at the variables or the, the decision points that con consumers and fleets are considering when they are looking at new vehicle purchases, um, they're looking at a variety of things. And, and those tables that I showed you before factored in all of those elements in making their forecast. So first, they're looking at technology costs. Uh, what is the purchase price of this particular vehicle compared to maybe your, your typical options? Energy costs, what's it going to cost per gallon uh, to fuel this vehicle up and what kind of fuel efficiency will you get? 
uh, vehicle compatibility. What kind of range and power, hauling and towing power is it going to have? Again, is it going to do the work that they demand of their diesel vehicle fleet presently? Uh, accessible infrastructure. We're talking about refueling or recharging uh, opportunities. How easy is that to come by and how uh, available is that in the, the marketplace that you work within? Uh, geopolitical concerns are things like, you know, how does this particular technology help us with reducing oil consumption or imports of foreign oil? Uh, environmental concerns, Troy touched on this a bit, you know, how, how will this fuel or this vehicle help us to reduce carbon and greenhouse gases? Maintenance, um, the cost of the vehicle upkeep itself and, and how does that compare with what we've been experiencing? And finally, automaker support. Um, are the automakers supporting this technology both in their current and future vehicles and, and working it in with their research and development efforts? So the great news for biodiesel is that it makes the grade on all of these fronts. Um, Troy's talked to you about a few of them and I'll go into a little bit more detail as well. Um, but but really, it makes uh, a whole lot of sense for fleets because biodiesel really is one of the, the least cost options to green your fleet operations. Um, so the question is, they can do it. Are they doing it? Are fleets um, actually implementing biodiesel programs? And the answer is yes to a growing extent. And like Troy said, we'd always like to see more of them. Um, but another organization that the National Biodiesel Board works closely with is the NTEA, which is the Association for the Work Truck Industry. Every year they put out a fleet purchasing outlook survey uh, to their members, which are largely fleets and equipment manufacturers. Um, as of 2017 survey, um, biodiesel, CNG, and E85 were the most widespread alternative fuel preferences for uh, that year. Um, so about 15% of fleets are currently using biodiesel blends in their operations. Um, they also ask, so looking ahead, what are your future uh, fuel and vehicle purchase plans? And again, biodiesel CNG and E85 uh, were at the, the top of the heap there. Um, electrics for, for all of their hype in the, the light duty market are still having a harder time making penetration in the medium and heavy duty market. Uh, simply because of the, the long range and heavy towing uh, requirements that, that those markets serve or require. Uh, Troy mentioned some, some case studies, which I definitely do encourage you to take a look at at the end of his presentation. Here's just a snapshot of some of the uh, notable biodiesel fleet users, um, just a few among many, and you're going to get to hear more from one of them um, here at the end of this session as well, so I won't steal his thunder, but um, a lot of, um, you know, very major fleets across many different types of industries and applications using biodiesel very successfully in their operations. So why are these fleets using biodiesel? Um, and let's take a little bit of a, another look at that. Um, Troy mentioned some of the economic advantages um, as well as some of the performance advantages. Just kind of looking at a, a from a big, per, a big picture perspective. Um, biodiesel is providing a very high quality fuel from domestic, sustainable, renewable resources. Uh, again, enhancing our energy security and, and allowing us to reduce the imports of foreign oil from parts of the world that may not always be uh, stable or friendly toward the U.S. Um, biodiesel also is doing great things for our domestic economy. It's supporting over 64,000 U.S. jobs and generating over $11 billion uh, dollars in total economic impact for the U.S. Again, great contributions to our, our gross domestic product here. Uh, as Troy mentioned earlier, biodiesel is doing great things for the environment as well in terms of reducing particulates, carbon monoxide, unburned hydrocarbons. Um, that was especially notable and is especially notable in the older engines, those um, prior to say 2010 when new after treatment systems were uh, implemented. Um, but also works exceedingly well in the new technology diesel engine. Um, you know, we've talked somewhat about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and um, biodiesel really does have the best carbon footprint of any U.S. produced fuel. So let's just take a, a quick look at that, what we mean by that. Um, we consider biodiesel carbon from a, a life cycle carbon perspective. 
So as the plant materials that are oftentimes used to produce biodiesel are growing, they are actually absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere, from the air. Um, and when you consider the process all the way from you know, growing those plants or crops in the field to the production of biodiesel to its actual end use in a vehicle, um, biodiesel on average provides an 80% reduction in carbon emissions compared to petroleum diesel. Uh, also in 2017, there was some new research that concluded that biodiesel reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 72% and fossil fuel use by 80% compared to petroleum diesel. So again, a lot of great uh, environmental benefits associated with the use of biodiesel blends. Um, another kind of factor that is, is heavily on the minds of OEMs is a looming heavy-duty truck standard rule that's being implemented by the EPA. So EPA is proposing to increase the efficiency in heavy-duty transportation significantly, you can see here, by 2027. Um, the end result that's desired from that is a, a cumulative greenhouse gas savings of over 1 billion tons of CO2. So it's, it's going to be a pretty heavy lift for the OEMs to get to that point in terms of technology. So they are looking uh, ever more closely at biodiesel as a, an enabling technology, if you will, to help them get there. So this kind of shows you um, how that trajectory could happen. So if you look here, the, the green bars kind of indicate the impact that the new newly designed uh, truck heavy duty vehicles would, would be contributing to those emissions reductions. Those kick in in 2021. Biodiesel has been making improvements for our atmosphere since the early 2000s. Um, and when you compile those benefits of, of biodiesel on top of the heavy duty truck rule, you see that we can make a, a much bigger dent in the CO2 emissions um, by using high quality biodiesel blends in today's new technology diesel engine. And it's working. As, as Troy mentioned, you know, he kind of showed you the snapshot of, of even just uh, one company's um, production and, and use of biodiesel blends. When we look at it from a macro perspective, uh, the 2.9 billion gallons of biodiesel and renewable diesel that were used in 2016 uh, reduced carbon emissions by over 24 million metric tons. Um, if you think about that in kind of real world terms that we could all relate to, that's similar to removing over 5 million cars from our roadways or planting 641 million trees or preserving over 23 million acres of forest. So uh, all of those things are making a significant impact in the marketplace. Um, and another great benefit of, of biodiesel is its sustainability. Oftentimes there's a lot of confusion on a, a food and fuel kind of debate in the marketplace and biodiesel, um, is really a success story in that regard um, because with biodiesel food isn't sacrificed for fuel in fact uh, making more biodiesel helps uh, make more food available and vice versa so the oils and fats that are are used for biodiesel production are a minor byproduct of producing food for humans and animals about 50 percent of the biodiesel that's currently produced and used in the united states is made from soybean oil uh, soybeans are about 80 percent protein and 20 percent oil so that 80% protein content is going into food and feed for humans and animals. Uh, we use a fraction of that oil content then to make a very high quality biodiesel. Uh, likewise, no one's growing more livestock for its fat content. Um, as meat production continues, we can use the byproducts, the fats from that meat processing uh, process to be able to make biodiesel. Uh, likewise, no one's cooking more french fries to get used oil. Uh, we're just able to use that waste product, the used cooking oil, again, to make a very high quality biodiesel product. So it's a, it's kind of the, the great recycler, if you will, um, making a great fuel out of something that otherwise would have gone into the waste stream. I'm gonna um, kind of round out my, my comments here talking about OEM support for biodiesel. This is really where uh, you know, the, the rubber meets the road, if you will, in terms of, um, so we have this great fuel, our, our OEM's gonna allow me to use it in my vehicles. The answer is absolutely yes. All major OEMs producing diesel vehicles for the US market support at least B5 biodiesel blends. Um, that, that's pretty much ubiquitous across the industry. Um, and if we're looking specifically kind of in the fleet or commercial vehicle class 
uh, with gross vehicle weight five through eight vehicles. Um, those account for about 92% of the on-road diesel fuel use presently, and nearly 90% of those medium and heavy-duty truck OEMs support the use of V20. So the vast majority of the equipment that's already in your fleet um, can use B20, um, or at the very least, B5. Um, likewise, nearly every major off-road equipment manufacturer supports B20 or higher biodiesel blends. So when you're looking at uh, agricultural or construction equipment or groundskeeping equipment, mining, that sort of thing, also they're at a B20 approval level. Um, we do work hard to keep a, a very comprehensive listing of OEM position statements on the National Biodiesel Board website. So I encourage you to check out biodiesel.org under using biodiesel and the OEM information tab uh, to get some more specific information on, on the OEM's positions there. Um, we also partner closely with the Diesel Technology Forum and uh, work with them to keep a running list of diesel vehicles available in the U.S. So I encourage you to check out their website as well for um, information on uh, the, the current models available for you. But here is a little sneak preview of um, many of those position statements and vehicles. Um, this is a, a couple slides of just quick snapshots of the, the many OEMs that are supporting B20. You can see kind of the Detroit Big Three, GM, Chrysler, Ford, um, mainstays in the medium duty truck market, you know, Isuzu, et cetera, um, the ag and off-road market with Caterpillar, Case, New Holland, John Deere. Cummins engines are kind of omnipresent both in on and off-road equipment. Um, and so, you know, that by nature um, has a lot of different OEMs supporting B20. In many cases, uh, an OEM's position on biodiesel will follow suit with whatever their engine manufacturer, the, the supplier of their engine, approves. So in the case of, um, for instance, Freightliner and Western Star, their models that are equipped with Cummins engines are approved for B20. Um, they do have some models that are equipped with Detroit diesel engines, and that is one of the lone holdouts in a, a B5 um, position. So we are still working very closely with Daimler, which owns uh, Detroit Diesel, to uh, move that position up to B20. Um, very notably, though, uh, back in 2016, um, we had been working with Packard, which is the engine manufacturer that supplies engines to Peterbilt and Kenworth. Um, and they, um, back in 2016, announced their full retroactive approval for B20 in all of their legacy and new model diesel engines. So now the entire fleet of Kenworth and Peterbilt trucks um, with Packard engines are approved for B20. That added about a million vehicles worth of, of B20 approved vehicles onto the roadways. So that was great news. General Motors is another uh, great champion in the biodiesel support arena. Uh, they offer 20 different diesel models, all approved for use with B20. Uh, Ford also a longtime supporter of biodiesel, um, supporting B20 in all of their super duty and medium duty trucks. And very exciting news uh, for you F-150 fans. They're coming out with a diesel F-150 in 2018 and just announced that it too is B20 approved. And as I mentioned, Fiat Chrysler's offerings in the truck, uh, pickup truck, uh, van, and SUV categories also B20 approved. So just as a, a wrap up here, uh, we are seeing a fight for a promising year for biodiesel ahead for OEMs and for fleets as well. Uh, we continued on a strong path with over 2.6 billion gallons of biomass-based diesel produced in U.S. Uh, last year, and that was even in the in a marketplace with a lapse tax incentive. As Troy mentioned uh, just a couple weeks ago, that biodiesel blenders tax credit was retroactively reinstated for 2017, and the biodiesel industry is continuing to push to uh, install that credit for 2018 and, and future years to um, breed more certainty into the marketplace. Uh, we do have renewable fuel standard volumes in place for 2018. Um, biodiesel qualifies under both the biomass-based diesel and advanced biofuel categories. Um, so again, uh, um, you know, strong marketplace indicators there. Um, and we are excited to see those growing number of diesel vehicle options for 2018. So um, as we continue to work with OEMs to support those, those uh, or that fuel in those vehicles and with fleets to use it, um, we see a very bright future ahead. Um, I'll let you take a look at these resources available to you again after the call. 
um, highly encourage you to check out these websites that have a vast array of resources for further information. And uh, my contact information is included there as well. And certainly invite your questions or conversation at any time. So thanks so much for your time and attention today. Thank you, Jennifer. A lot of great information from our first two speakers. Um, and we're just we're just excited about all the great things that are going on across this great country. So um, our next speaker is Mr. Michael Dimitrov. He's the manager of Air Initiatives for the Chicago Park District. Welcome, Michael. And Troy, thank you. I'm here to, uh, I guess, serve as an example of all the great information you just heard about biodiesel. Um, I'm with the Depar uh, Chicago Park District, and Carl introduced me as manager of air initiatives. That's apropos, but I'm actually manager of art initiatives. I started in uh, sustainability. I didn't want to let it go, and that's how this program came about. So I'll move ahead uh, and just talk about some of the things that uh, we do at the park uh, in terms of sustainability efforts. Let me get the right slide up here. Sorry. So a park district is involved, uh, of course, you think about programming, recreation, lake activities. The park has 26 miles of lakefront. Uh, so the park wants to also serve as uh, a leader in sustainability and environmental efforts. Uh, to that end, we have a uh, renewable fuel fleet. We have a lumber reuse uh, agreement with uh, recycling our emerald ash borer ash. We have wind power. Uh, supply for our power source, which is now sourced as 75% of wind and alternative energy. We practice LEED certified buildings, car sharing, bike sharing, clean marinas program, the certified marinas as sustainable, and we are really conscious on waste and recycling practices. So um, with this initiative, uh, our biodiesel program started um, Back in 2010, uh, here's a composition of the Park District vehicle fleet, 550 overall, and you can see the breakdown of E85 hybrids, and natural gas, and diesel. In 2010, the Park District had the opportunity to take over a defunct City of Chicago fueling facility. Uh, the city decided it was too small for its uses since it only housed two tanks, 6,000 gallons each. Uh, the park district decided to make an investment and push into the biodiesel as sort of a pilot program, uh, which has now become an exemplifier of, of a good practice. We took over the tanks, uh, converted the, the facility with a dispenser that mixes at the dispenser, and uh, we set up an agreement with uh, a great partner in Darling Ingredients. Darling agreed to provide feedstock for us, which was... Uh, uh, yellow grease feedstock. <clears throat> Here's a picture of the facility. Um, the park was interested in this because it was it's really a carbon neutral feedstock. It's already been served to fuel uh, french fries and fryers throughout the city. So it's recycled uh, you know, vegetable oil grease for food. We take that through Darling and then we found out uh, that we could send that to a processor and have that converted into usable B99. Uh, and bring that back to us at no cost. Since we had uh, this whole agreement started with a donation of the feedstock, uh, we used the feedstock as a credit source and served that to process and also transport biodiesel back to us where we mixed it at this facility for our fleet. Uh, we fuel diesel trucks, cab overs, forestry units, clam units, uh, bucket trucks, beach combers and our cutting mowers, uh, John Deere cutting mowers. Now, this facility only serves about a third of the lakefront area. So technically it's a pilot. Uh, all of our drivers that drive diesel vehicles can, can fuel here as uh, convenience, but we're focusing on this area exclusively that everyone comes to this facility fuels with V20. Um, one of the things that when we started the program that we had to be very concerned about is how do we initiate that? I think that's come up a couple times. Where do you start? What's your comfort level? Well, I was not a fleet member and our fleet director was very cautious about cold, cold flow and cloud point and uh, park district vehicles and plows 
breaking down in low temperatures. So that was a really big area of concern. We decided to talk to the fleet, um, our fleet partners at the city of Chicago. In fact, you'll see that the fueling track system we're on is still is on uh, city of Chicago fleet. And so it's being monitored by fleet. And so we wanted to roll out in such a way that there wouldn't be a problem. We had a lot of older vehicles. And so with the lubricity and the breakdown, uh, a lot of times the fuel lines get cleaned, you lose the varnish and the fuel, it could clog filters. We wanted to make sure that there wasn't any increase in, um, in maintenance cost, and we wanted to document all that. So we started out very slow. We started out with a B5, um, and then we had orientation sessions with all of our landscape folks who were gonna fuel. So we did a combination of starting slow, communication, communication with fleet, and communicating with practitioners and fueling practices. And then we, we gradually ramped up. So we started with uh, a B10 for a period, and then we ramped up to a B20. And you'll see, excuse me. Sorry about the slide, I can't get the order here. No, it's not there, anyway. Uh, we started low and worked our way up. Uh, what we found is that in the summertime, of course, you can ramp up to B20. The city of Chicago was on a ration uh, for fuel reduction costs, so they only use a certain amount of, of biodiesel through the summer. One of our goals with the park district was to demonstrate that we have uh, zero maintenance issues, that we had increased um, increased efficiency, lower particulates with no uh, maintenance problems. And then we were trying to pitch the city of Chicago to incorporate a higher use of board biodiesel. So I guess one of the things to consider when you're implementing is uh, what's been mentioned by Troy and, and Jennifer is uh, fuel supply, quality, uh, maintenance, how to train drivers and how to track data to show your your advantages. We've done all that. Uh, we've we've got a partnership through the Darling Ingredient donation with REG, who processes our fuel, like the Troy and Company. Uh, they come back with uh, the BQ 9000. We mix at our dispenser at 39th Street, and so we can micro adjust for weather conditions as well. So we generally have one tank that has straight diesel in it, and the other one is B99. And so we can blend uh, on demand uh, at the tank. And that solves some of the issues with concerns for temperature that, that are going too low or you've got some conditions that you want to modify. We've gone over vehicle compatibility with both presentations. We have John Deere uh, mowing units and some Toro and Kubota. We are using V20 uh, plus in all of those and without any problems. In fact, uh, John Deere, uh, we've pushed up to, uh, I don't think the slide is in here, but we've gone up to B55 uh, last summer without issue. And the good thing about that is that uh, our average biodiesel blend is a B20. We've been asked to join the Illinois B20 Club, which is under the uh, guidance of the American Lung Association. So we are improving what we feel is our quality of uh, health and environment in Chicago. Our biggest health affliction with young people in the city is asthma. Um, we've got testimonials from our drivers of our mowing units that there is no longer any particulate matter coming out of the tailpipe. They don't think about their job as much. They don't feel uh, that they're breathing anything and they feel the benefits directly in what we're doing. We talked to uh, a little bit about solvency and how uh, the fuels affect, uh, biodiesel affects the fuel systems. Uh, for those of you who are just starting out, again, you, you start out slow. Here's some of the reasons that happens when biodiesel gets put in and has its detergent quality. So it will kick out some of the impurities in the trucks and the fuel lines and the tanks, excuse me. Um, you may want to start with new filters Start out slow, monitor things, and uh, keep that data as you go. I'll zip through these a little bit. 
Uh, the big difference with biodiesel usage was in the uh, the valves and the synthetic rubbers that were used in the older models. So, uh, Viton is a is a brand name of rubber lines and seals that now is acceptable V20 and beyond. So, you can pretty much figure if you can if you're spec for V20, you can uh, figure at some point you can probably push to B99 because it, it won't affect the seals any further once you get past B20. Fuel storage, if you have uh, tanks, you want to make sure that, you know, uh, there are some dividing lines between fuels at the interface. So you get algae, uh, you've got buildups of microbes. But the thing to remember is that uh, it's good to monitor the systems and have a good service provider that knows uh, the best way to treat the fuel. So we have a good provider with the park district who's been with us since the onset of the program. We send out our fuels to get checked um, for oxidation and, and all of the, the impurities that may be in there. So it's um, that monitoring by a third party is also is very helpful. We send the fuels out to a, an impartial tester to figure out what exactly we have in the tank. When we get our fuel back from REG, there's always specifications listed, as Troy mentioned. So the quality is never a problem. Uh, it's always good to check uh, for contamination and microbes and things that may be occurring in your in the fuel. But these are standard practices with your with your fueling stations. Aged fuel. Uh, there's been some concern that uh, biodiesel over let let uh, sit in the tank for a while is going to lose and, and and lose its purity and, and combustibility. That's been proven this year by Steve Howe. Uh, a chemist who works with the National Biodiesel Board that uh, you can pretty much have biodiesel sit for a year and not affect uh, its, its conditions. We had some concern with the city, but they have backup generators that have, they were asking whether or not they should use biodiesel fuel in those. And uh, the suggestion was, yes, go ahead, but monitor it and, and appropriately uh, treat the fuel. We set up a, a visual read at our 39th Street facility, you see different biodiesel blends marked out in little vials. And so that at any point in time, we can actually do a visual check of what the temperature is and what the cloud point's looking at uh, on top of the tank. So this is just a simple way of, of for us to double check and to show drivers the difference in fuel. So you see full diesel on the left, B5, B10, B15, and the cloudiness as it goes across. You can't read the thermometer, I think, but it's at about 10 or 20, 10 or 15 degrees. Cold weather is also, was always the biggest uh, threat or supposed threat with biodiesel uh, for municipalities. And uh, we set out to disprove that because our main goal was to show uh, those at large in the city that um, we could dispel that myth with proper additives and proper monitoring and blending. Uh, we've done that. We, like I said, we're now run uh, on B20 blends year round. Um, we've exceeded to uh, well over 50% of biodiesel in the summer. We are keeping that data and actually uh, California has asked for our data so that they can utilize that because that the wall was B20. Everyone was looking at data up to B20. But since we've exceeded that and not many fleets have exceeded, uh, they're asking for data just to demonstrate you know, efficiency uh, of product use and uh, what type of returns for fuel efficiency we have with that data. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, Troy and, and Jennifer both gone over the attributes uh, of, of biodiesel, and you can see that for us in the state, we have the tax incentive. So uh, at B11 or above, you don't have to pay for the, uh, the tax on the fuel. Of course, the park district is tax exempt. It doesn't affect us. But for me, uh, every gallon of diesel saves, uh, displants a gallon of, of straight diesel fuel. So for our program purposes, we are, we're saving a lot more money because we're not paying for the fuel at the beginning uh, since it's a more of a barter process. Um, you can see that uh, we're being, we're acting as leaders, and that was our plan. Uh, the benefits are, uh, like everyone has mentioned, increased uh, particulates, decreased carbon monoxide, NOx emissions, um, you know, increased environment, cleaner air, and that's been our that's been our mission. 
Um, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to say that for us, uh, from pilot to now operating at a B20 level, has been a very smooth run. It's doable. Uh, you plan it out. Uh, you communicate with your fleet team. You roll it out gently, and uh, you just keep pushing from there. And the benefits uh, you will, you will reap. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, very interesting. Um, as uh, you were typing in your questions to ask the panel, we do have a couple of questions I'd like to read off. And the first one is for uh, for Mike. And uh, with uh, the question is, with the Park District's uh, success rate of use of biodiesel, are other departments in the city of Chicago looking at implementing um, forms of biodiesel? Michael? Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Okay, sorry. Uh, great question. So we convened a meeting with uh, our fuel provider, my service provider, the B20 Club, and a chemist to show the city of Chicago exactly what we've done over the last four years and pitch them into how, as uh, you know, the second city, that we need to up our game in terms of biodiesel. Uh, the good news is uh, they, we opened their eyes and they are now operating on permanent B10 with the hopes of S elevating to B20 over the summer months. Wonderful. Um, I think this question relates to Troy or Jennifer. Uh, the question is, are there any special labeling requirements on retail pumps for the use of biodiesel? I can address that. Um, so, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, biodiesel blends up to 5% or B5 uh, do not need to be labeled. They are considered um, just fungible with diesel fuel and meet the same uh, ASTM specs as diesel fuel, which is ASTM B975. So, you can and most likely are using a B5 blend um, just interchangeably with diesel fuel pretty much everywhere now. Um, above a B5 blend, there is a, a separate label, um, typically kind of a light blue and black label that will say um, this contains a blend of between 6 and 20% biodiesel, a B6 to B20. Um, that kind of range allows retailers some flexibility in terms of maybe seasonal changes in the blend that they're offering. Um, you know, if, if maybe they're using a, a or pumping a B20 blend in the summer months and might back down to a, a B5 or B6 in the, the colder months. Um, so that allows them some flexibility there. Um, anything above a B20 blend needs to be specifically labeled with the actual blend percentage. So if it's offering a B30, it needs to be marked specifically B30. Um, so those are typically the, the, the types of um, nomenclature that you would see on on pumps and in in chicago for instance mike mentioned um, because they have um, a tax incentive or you know remove the sales tax from any gallon containing more than b10 they pump an awful lot of uh, b11 in the state of illinois and so um, i think it's close to going on 60 percent of the diesel fuel in illinois actually contains um, b11 at least up to b20 um, close to year round uh, thank you for that, Jennifer. Um, this next question, I think it's uh, for Troy. And uh, Troy, one of the questions is, uh, are local bio-based products used in local biodiesel plants to reduce transportation miles and costs? And then the uh, second question would be, are the bio components local to the market or do they come from um, elsewhere? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that question. I, I think they're talking about, um, I think the question relates to like the feedstock used to produce the biodiesel and if that's coming locally and, and um, it, it depends, I guess, is the, is the short answer, but certainly we always look for the reduction in, in transportation costs. So we're trying to match um, the, the closest feedstock sources to the biodiesel plant uh, to reduce that cost because once you start shipping stuff, greater distances then your feedstock cost is going to go up so we always try to try to match um, um, those we aren't going to take a, a feedstock from um, you know 
Texas necessarily, and and um, you know bring it up to the Midwest when it could be used if it could be used in a plant uh, that we have down in in Texas. We're going to try to you know keep it in the markets and make the most sense uh, uh, to reduce those costs. Great. Well, thank thank you for that. Um, I don't see any more questions on our website, so I just wanted to, again thank you uh, to our speakers. And then thanks again for joining us on behalf of the Lake Michigan Consortium. We look forward to seeing everyone at our upcoming Lake Michigan Consortium Green Drives event on Thursday, May 17th at the Northern Illinois University in Naperville. And please see any of our websites for additional information. And remember, it's never too late to begin your environmental legacy. Thanks for joining us today, folks.